Well, hi there. So in this video, we're going to be uh, taking a look at the first of the two practice problems that go along with central banks. So uh, let's get started. So it first starts with the Bank of Clayton and this following balance sheet. And one thing to note is actually we've seen this balance sheet before, because as I told you before, this is a, a AP problem. And what AP really likes to do is they give you a bank balance sheet problem. And they basically ask you a ton of little questions about like Susie withdraws a thousand dollars. What happens to M1? Blah, 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 blah. You know, if the bank has this many reserves and what's the reserve ratio, blah, 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 blah. And then the very end of the problem will look like this. So if you kind of combine this one with the other one that was the bank balance sheets practice, you get actually the AP exam problems that show up all the time. So the first thing here says, suppose the Federal Reserve purchases $5,000 worth of bonds from Clayton Bank. The central bank pays for the bonds in the form of $5,000 credited to Clayton Bank as excess reserves. So that's an open market operation. It's exactly how we talked about it in the lecture video. They buy bonds and they give them excess reserves. What are the immediate new values for the following? So this is basically saying, don't multiply anything out. Don't do any of this money multiplier nonsense. Just tell me how did the bank balance sheet change? Nothing crazy. So let's start with what did they do? Well, the Fed bought $5,000 worth of bonds. So we already right off the bat know that this isn't going to be seven anymore. And I'm just going to work through what happens here, 2000. So because they took them away, right? The Fed bought them and they said, you don't get to keep those anymore. Now, what did they give them? Well, it tells you that they give them excess reserves. And so we say now they have $5,000 worth of excess reserves. And now if you look at it from the bank's perspective, the bank's like, well, okay, that's fine, sure. That's why the bank doesn't really care because from their perspective, it's still an asset and it's exactly the same amount of money as they had before, right? It deletes 5,000 worth of bonds, but it increases 5,000 worth of excess reserves. So the bank's like, Bleh, whatever. Now we notice that nothing changed on the liability side, right? From the perspective of ordinary you, you know, you, me, the Joe Schmo who's banked at Bank of Clayton their whole lives, we have no idea when they did that. And it doesn't really matter. Like our bank account still shows $10,000 in it. Savings account still shows $3,000. It doesn't matter. The amount that they have to keep at the Bank of Clayton in required reserves also didn't change because nothing changed in demand deposits. It didn't happen. So the new amount um, of excess reserves is 5,000 because they started with nothing. The new amount of demand deposits is the same as it was before, 10,000. The new amount of bonds is now 2,000. And the total amount of liabilities is still what we have, which is $20,000. So the total amount of assets and the total amount of liabilities don't really change because it's just moving money from one side of the assets to another. Now let's take a look at a different kind of concept. We're gonna come back and practice with balance sheets again. <laughs> don't you worry. But this is more like explaining the little connection points, right? And I actually wanna show you how basically the story that we told where like, you know, you've got this consumption and investment and it causes this, that, and the other can end up in two places. And this is going to get kind of weird, but it's actually kind of gets you to think about what can happen when the Fed does this stuff. So the first part, it says, fill up the chart below, assume the economy is operating below full employment. And the bank conducts an open market operation to correct the gap. So if they're below full employment, what does that mean? Right? What does that phrase mean in terms of where we are? I mean, we're in a recession, expansion, or an equilibrium. And if we're below full employment, it means we're in a recession. So the goal of the Fed, right, the goal is to increase output and therefore decrease unemployment and increase price levels, right? So that's going to be the goal. That's where we want to end up is more output. So we want to have basically more output. And so we want there to be more consumption spending. We want there to be more investment spending. The economy is in the tank. We want to boost it. So how do we do that? Well, we can lower interest rates, right? That's how we want excuse me, that's how we want to we want to boost consumption and investment. It would be the first and, and maybe the first of many times that I belch on camera. So my apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> this could tell you that I'm doing these all in one take because I totally just am like, eh, that's fine. I burped. Who cares? Um, the interest rate, though, we want to push that down. Well, how do we get the interest rate to go down? We increase the supply of money, right? We push the supply bigger to make the price go down. And so in order to make the money supply bigger, you got to buy bonds. So this is the story you're going to have to work yourself through on a test. If you're doing it on the AP test, you're going to have to know how to do this like on the fly. I'm not going to be able to walk you through it. You can't open your notes and be like, oh, the, the bigger, buy bonds, money supply bigger. That's what we want to do. So buy bonds, bigger. 
And by the way, on a test, they'll often ask you, what's the open market operation they should do? And if you don't respond with buy bonds or sell bonds, and you say something like, well, I don't know, lower the discount rate, doesn't count because the discount rate's not an open market operation. And the reserve requirement is not an open market operation. It's a totally separate tool of the Fed. They might ask you about that. Um, but the tool of the Fed that's most common is open market operations. And you can either buy, buy or sell bonds. Now, if they buy bonds, money supply gets bigger, right? So the supply of money increases. So we'd say the interest rate will go down. Actually, I probably don't need the I because that's short run interest rate goes down. Consumption and investment goes up. Now let's go over to this side of the story. We know that consumption and investment are part of aggregate demand. So aggregate demand will go up. Price levels and inflation should go up. Now, here's where this gets wacky. In the long run, think about what would happen to the interest rate if the price levels are going up. Now, ignore what happened at the beginning of this problem. Just kind of think back to when we learned about like interest rates and inflation and that kind of thing. And if you're a lender and you like to lend money to people, and prices are getting higher and higher and higher. In order for you to get basically the same interest that you used to be able to get, you're going to have to raise your interest rate, right? Because prices are higher, and we know that real interest rates take into account inflation. So if inflation's higher, and you want to keep your real interest rate the same, you're going to have to make your interest rate, the nominal rate that you charge people, higher. And so it causes long-run interest rates to go right back up. So it actually, in the long run, the interest rate doesn't change. This is weird. I know it's weird, but in the short run, right, the Fed can go like and blow on the fire and make it go woof, woof, right? Like a little oxygen on the fire. But in the long run, it's not really determined by like that. The fire will die back down again to the interest rate that it used to be at. So if you wanted to, right, you could juice the economy if you're the Fed and you can twist the interest rate a little bit. But in the long run, the interest rate's going to go right back to where it started because of this effect of the higher price level and lenders would raise the interest rate. Now, here's a, a little wacky one as well. Here we can say if investment spending goes up, what happens to the purchases of capital goods? You got to know what those are. That's equipment, right? That's machinery, equipment, machinery, tools, factories, stuff to produce stuff. Well, if you're doing more investment spending, you're spending money on tools, machinery, factories, that kind of thing. So there's more of it. And what does that do to your productive capacity, to your productivity? It makes it bigger. What does that do to long-run growth? It makes it bigger. Now, here's where this story gets wackadoo, right? The one version of this story would actually tell you that the Fed can't really affect long-run growth rates because in the long run, the interest rate will just go right back to where it started again, and it's all kind of a wash. But another version of this story will actually tell you that the Fed can have a real effect on the amount of growth rates. Which one is true? I don't know. Maybe a little bit of both. In fact, they are totally an opposite to each other. And if these two don't seem like they're opposite, they are. Because this one is basically saying the interest rate will just spring back up like a rubber band back to where it used to be. And the consumption and investment, you might get a little bit of it, but there's not going to be enough to really change growth rates. Right? That's one side of the story. And then in the long run, the Fed can't really change anything except prices. If they create more money and they make the money supply bigger, it'll just cause prices to go up. And that's all that changes. But the other side of the story is that the Fed can have like a real effect on the real economy of like how many machines and tools and factories and all that other stuff is through investment spending, right? Which one's true? Like I said, I don't know, both maybe. The AP exam is actually going to ask you about both stories. They're not going to ask you both in the same question, typically. They're usually going to like ask you a leading series of questions, and they'll lead you much as I've done here. They'll say, okay, based on your answer about what happened to the interest rate, what happens to investment spending? And then you say it goes up. And then it'll say, for the next part of the question, it'll say, now, based on your answer in that, with investment spending, what happens to the production of capital goods and equipment and productivity? And you say, then it goes up, boss. And then they say, what happens to long-run growth rates? And you say, well, productivity went up, so long-run growth rates. Basically, follow the direction that the question is asking you, and you'll be just fine. Um, but it, it, it is weird, and it'll show up in different parts of the AP test. And they are really an opposite. That's because economics doesn't agree. Um, we don't actually have full agreement in economics on which one of these stories is, is more true than the other. Uh, more research is needed. And that's what you need to do. Anyways, I'll see you next time.